Welcome back to the Revolution and Ideology podcast. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are talking about the French Revolution, the revolution that all other revolutions are measured against, or so we'd like to think. So the French Revolution remains cited as arguably the most influential traditional revolution among like scholars and the popular imagination of, of constituents all around the world. It clearly exemplifies all the hallmarks of a, re- a political revolution, particularly in its first couple stages, of which we're going to focus on only those. We're not going to go through like later parts of the uh, uh, late 1800s, or even some might say it lasts through the early, early 1900s. But from both a real and relative deprivation standpoint uh, to the multiple forms of resistance across demographic lines, to organization, to mass propaganda, to the synthesis of like cause, to upheaval, to counter revolutions throughout like the 18th and 19th century, France appears to offer a template that like all the other revolutions find themselves following at least all of the revolutions from the French Revolution on. And of course, there was definitely a changing of the guard, so it qualifies under most definitions as revolutionary. But when people look deeper, when we're going to look deeper, there were certainly backslides to awfully autocratic regimes and even a monarchy in the following century. However, some might argue that this made the revolution even grander in scale. Uh, because the French Revolution never really ended. And while we'll mostly engage the famed early stages in this module, it should be acknowledged that the revolutionary process lasted at least a century longer. France is technically on its fifth republic right now. And through today, the French people maintain a certain pride and right to continue to alter their society, unconventionally if they so choose. The Second Declaration and the Rights of Man and the Citizen guarantees Uh, This. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression, which, of course, we could compare uh, here in the United States to the right to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances in another very famous document. But the French appear willing to entertain all methods of progress. Yep. What do you think, Nick? No, I love that it specifically says resist oppression and does not specify how you have to do that. Right. Where in the United States it very clearly does. Right. Also important to note when we kind of go over this overview of the French Revolution and of much, much greater global significance is the French Revolution's impact on ideology. So this channel obviously is called Ideology or Revolution and Ideology. We're going to talk about both of them in this episode because the French Revolution exemplifies a changing of the guard in, 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 in both of these cases. The revolutionary process in France not only ended material systems, but the backing hegemonic ideals behind them. And some, um, which have been around for centuries, like absolutism and feudalism, um, even Catholicism to an extent, even though Catholicism isn't abolished, it certainly becomes subordinate to the new ideologies that spring forth from the French Revolution. This is what makes this such a revolutionary event in the minds of like historians and again, popular theorists and so on and so forth. All of the ideologies that are eliminated or subordinated um, have ones that eventually take their place. And the ones that we want to focus on the most in this episode here, and we have like our own like little, little videos on them, would be economic liberalism and nationalism. Those would be the ideologies that fundamentally change due to the French Revolution, or maybe not even change. We could argue in the case of nationalism, are invented. So um, let's actually dig into some of this, this history. What, do, what, what are we breaking down? What's the old order here, Nick? Absolutism and feudalism, what are these? Those are the old order. Those are the two um, ideological and material practices that are fundamentally broken down by the French Revolution. But before we do like, talk about them or talk about how they're broken down, let's talk about what they are. So absolutism, we would argue, is sort of the political system at the time, the monarchical system, the king and a queen and so on. People are familiar with that. And feudalism is basically the economic order of the time, which is the idea of lords and serfs and so on, where the lord uh, controls the land, which is where the term landlord comes from. And the serfs are work, the peasants, if you will, uh, work the land under the lord. Dope. Okay. For those of uh, our listeners that know what the structuralist revolutionary lens is offered to us by Theta Scotch Paul, we're going to talk a little bit about the structuralist revolutionary approach, pr- approach. In short, long story short, it's this idea that the macro conditions of a society are the ones that heavily influence the revolutionary process. So rather than just people like being upset for no reason, this kind of sets that context in place. Like what's going wrong to make people want to revolt? In this case, we're going to focus um, uh, predominantly on back-to-back wars fought by the French monarchy. 
first the Seven Years' War and then the U.S. War for Independence. And yes, that is correct. The French, re- the French fought the U.S. War for Independence. Um, so real quickly, Seven Years' War uh, was a war fought on a global scale. Uh, it really started in the Ohio Valley of North America between the British colonists and French colonists or French colonial process over who gets to control the resources of, of essentially the Ohio Valley. I'm not going to go through the war. Uh, we've done it in past episodes with like the War for Independence and our, our Myth is America series. But What is important is to note that in this case, unlike the British, the French lost this war. So while the war was wildly expensive for both um, of the two primary parties here, England and France, um, at least England might in the future be able to recoup some of its expense of this war through what perhaps taxing its colonists or through the economic growth of having this land now uh, accessible to them. Mm -hmm. France doesn't get that. They're going, they lost. They don't actually, they lose their fair trade in North America. They lose a whole bunch of Caribbean colonies. Like, this is a big deal for France. And so the war was expensive, and they're go, they get none of the, the where riches of, of, of winning this war. Yeah, the way it's the like British. worst case scenario, right? You yeah. spend a ton of resources and don't win. And yeah, and, and at this point, that war was completely material based. So yeah, you're screwed. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, the war on the North American continent eventually leads to the U.S. War for Independence and as a way to essentially, uh, some might say, get back at the British, the French decide that they're going to help the revolutionaries uh, in the United States or what would become the United States. Not the United States, bad, but the English colonists that are fighting for their independence. And mm-hmm. France invests heavily in that war through, like, again, loans, uh, providing munitions, providing arms, providing food, providing uniforms. It's super expensive for the French monarchy to help support the colonists. And and when the colonists, uh, unpopular in the United States to say, but when the colonists are actually losing, France then jumps in with actual troops and the French Royal Navy, um, which, again, this is a very expensive endeavor. And it is really this French jumping into the war and helping the colonists actually fight it that turns the tide for the colonists. And eventually the colonists, as, as we all know, spoiler alert, the colonists eventually earn their independence from England. And, and France, of course, invested heavily in that. Unfortunately for the French monarchy, um, two, two things will make it very difficult for them to reap any of those rewards. First, uh, the country, the new United States is too new to really uh, be able to afford uh, uh, to pay back France uh, in terms of its war debt. Secondly, once the country has established its economy a little bit under um, the Washington regime through, of course, its treasurer, Alexander Hamilton, they decide that they actually outwardly are not going to pay back the French. They decide that's just not going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so interestingly enough, France has now fought back-to-back wars, wildly costly, and are not getting recompensated. Even though they technically won the second one. They they technically won the second one for the colonists. Anyway, this is like the structuralist approach, uh, or the structuralist lens to why the French people are going to be upset. Why might they be upset about these back-to-back wars? So let's, let's couch this in the idea. Let's say you are a mere peasant or serf in the French countryside, and you're vaguely aware of these back-to-back wars. Um, what, what the hell do they have to do with you? Yeah, I mean, you actually don't care about the wars at all, probably, but you do care about What's going to happen is your government's going to tax the shit out of you to pay for the wars. That's the key, right? Louis XVI and his nobles, his nobility, the ones that heavily invested in the war, they're going to seek some sort of recompense for these back-to-back wars. And rather than finding, like, new and interesting ways to get that recompense, they decide they're going to tax their own I don't even want to call them citizens because it's not a nation state, but their own people. Mm-hmm. They will be a nation state through this revolutionary process. Right. Um, but they're going to tax the hell out of their own people. They're going to overwork them, and they're going to tax them. And and here's another little part of the structuralist lens that is often overlooked. It's not just like the the wars or the political reality of the time. France actually has um, a couple of poor harvests at this time in the 1780s, which make it very difficult for a lot of these common people to even eat, much pl- much less play, pay their taxes. So in this case, it's not just that they're feeling relative deprivation as maybe the English colonists were um, in North America, they're feeling real deprivation, like actual deprivation. Um, so Yeah, this, so the story, like the structuralist right. perspective, right, isn't that all of these French people ga- came together and were like just so motivated to overthrow the king, it's that these global macro structures played into the emergence of the revolution, the two wars that they lost, the taxation, and then right. the poor crop yields and famine. So, like, the Bourbon dynasty as the Ancien Regime is, I mean, they're, they're, they're been relatively entrenched for generations at this point in time. But they've accrued a massive debt. 
the regime itself and the way society is structured is is growing antiquated, even compared to their rival England, which already has like a Bill of Rights dating back to like the late 1600s and this kind of working English constitution and separation of powers between the monarchy and a House of Lords and a House of Commons and a judicial system. This regime in France is already antiquated. And then you throw on top of that um, back-to-back expensive wars, a couple of famines, and the situation was just like ripe for change, mm-hmm. right? It was just ripe. Um, anyway, to, to talk specifically about the tax system real quickly, Louis XVI, in trying to kind of like fix all of these issues, and again, it's not just him, it's his advisors, it's the nobility, it was wildly inadequate to deal with the massive debt of these back-to-back wars. Through these wars, he had taken out loans from mostly the elites in Paris and around him, and in addition to taking out these loans from these elite influential people, he offered them actual like offices in his court. So he's basically like selling um, – um, I, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for. He's like selling political influence is what he's really doing mm-hmm. and thus making himself like subject to their whims as well. Well, if you're selling political influence to, of course, the already wealthy um, uh, elite of Paris, whose policies are you now going to likely have to follow? Right. They don't care about the poor. They don't care that the poor, in some cases, are literally starving. They just want their material wealth back. And this isn't even like they're not even hiding sort of this. We would yeah. view this as corruption, right? Like they, he literally is selling seats in the government. Right. He's complicating the pit- political patronage and favors that had, I, I don't want to say worked in France prior to this, because I, I don't necessarily agree with like this absolutist monarchy, but that had kind of worked, I suppose, in terms of like uh, just making the system run. Um, they all decided that heavy repressive taxes on all of the people, aside from, of course, themselves, i.e. the nobility, and to a lesser extent, the clergy, were the answer to, to, to kind of fix the economic issues that were plaguing France, uh, France after the back-to-back war. They bring on a dude named Jacques Necker, and he comes in as the comptroller. He realizes that the repressive taxes are not the answer. So this is an economic expert that they hire, essentially, to come in as the comptroller, and he realizes that what they've decided, i.e. ultra-repressive taxes on the middle and lower classes, will not will not help the situation at all, will right. actually make it worse. They decide that they're going to actually fire him. So he, they bring him on, he tells them things they don't want to hear that might actually help, and they fire him instead. And, of course, the crisis deepens. As the crisis deepens, in 1789, Louis calls a meeting of the Estates General, which was the first meeting since 1614. It's basically a meeting of the three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else. And this, of course, is super famous in revolutionary history. Um, they met on May 5th of 1789 in at Versailles, and it actually opened with a speech uh, by uh, Jacques Necker, who they brought back for a, uh, 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 because he actually proved to be so popular among the people as finance minister. Like, so the people had already kind of voiced their concern over this dude's dismissal. They brought him back, and he opens a speech of the meeting of the three estates on May 5th of 1789. A total of 1,201 delegates meet, and the first two estates represent, um, I mean, I don't know, at most like 500,000 people in all of France, whereas like the third estate um, represents like the rest of the population. Some estimates have it as high as like 95%. So you have three estates that are supposed to kind of like equitably represent the influence um, of what French culture is or what the French identity is or what the French, I don't even know, leadership should look like, right? The people, the clergy, and the uh, the nobility. But in actual like proportions, who represents most of the French people? Third estate. The third sure. estate. And so the third estate um, only gets actually one third of the vote at the table, but they represent like 95% of the population. This is the inequity um, that will eventually, of course, be called out during the revolutionary process. It's like the French Electoral College. Yeah, no, that's actually a super good example. Oh, totally. Um, during this this first meeting, a book of grievances is provided to in assist to is provided to assist in the discussions between the first, second, and third estate representatives. Um, it's not super radical, and this book of grievances is basically in full support of keeping the monarchy and only making like minor reforms to deal with these specific grievances. Press censorship during these meetings eventually was lifted and things get a little bit more radical. One of the most famous publications or basically statements of this time comes from um, actually the clergy in this case, from an abbot uh, named C.A. Uh, I can never pronounce it. C.A.? Yeah. No anyway. Um, and it is this, this statement basically that is what he asked this question. What is the third estate? Everything. What has it been until now in the political order? Nothing. What does it want to be? Something. 
why is this this such a famous saying? It's not like super provocative. I could read so many quotes in like history mm-hmm. that are way more like, you know, fire than this. But like, why is this this such a lasting like quote in revolutionary circles? Yeah, this is like the super famous question of the French Revolution: What is the third estate? They're trying to. I mean, like he says, right, they've been nothing, they're everyone, but they've been nothing in the history of the p- politics in France, and the revolution that's coming is going to try to make them something, right? They're establishing their identity, they're taking, they're realizing their power in numbers. Who are the people? Yeah. Like, this is like one of those statements where, like, and this is what makes it kind of a landmark revolution, where, like, we are asking, who are the people? Mm-hmm. Even the American War for Independence, which precedes this by about a decade, maybe a little bit less, but does not actually ask this question. Nope. Right? It does not ask who the people are. Even after the war is won, the people are still decided. It was rich, white, Christian dudes. Like, that's what that still ran the country or re- actually ran the new country even after the American War for Independence. It is the absence of radicalism there. Which is why the French, one of the, I think, defining factors of the French Revolution and how it differs from right. the American War for Independence is that they're. The French Revolution is asking this question: Who are the people? Right. It's not super popular to say this in the United States because everyone likes to, you know, have this like you know, whatever. I don't know this uh, weird celebratory notion of what the American War for Independence was about, but it really was just a war of independence in terms of ideology and practice. Not a whole hell of a lot changed for people. In France, it's going to be very different, right? Yes, the colonists do win their independence from England, but again, the the people running society don't change. The ideologies don't change, right? I mean, like Women still had no power. Right. Slavery actually got worse. Wars on indigenous people actually got worse. Um, socioeconomic stratification actually got worse. Hamiltonian economics further like stratified like the the wealth gap. I mean, things you're got a white worse. Dude, like you're a Yalman farmer and right. wherever. Like your life changed none basically. Right. Except you ended up getting taxed more eventually. But yeah, especially if you happen to be like working on wheat or rye in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and you want to distill that into whiskey, your life definitely got worse. But right. that, that, that's a conversation we've already had in the Myth Is America series. For the French Revolution, this question, that's why it's such a hallmark question of this like Enlightenment era, uh, of these Enlightenment era Atlantic revolutions. They begin to question who the people are and who should be actually represented by their government. Mm-hmm. They take it to a new level. So the National Assembly is established from the commons. They establish this notion of the commons, the commons being like that, that 95%. Do you have a better definition of like the commons like that we can use here? No, I mean, I think that it, I think that's good, right? It's the people, the, right. yeah, that's it. It's the people. This national uh, assembly that is established from the commons um, becomes the entity for the people, though the estate, uh, not the estates, though they did invite this national assembly, they invited the clergy and nobility to have some representation there if they wanted to play ball with the national assembly. So a, a few of these, a few like more radical clergy members, mostly clergy more so than nobility, did show up with the national assembly and try and work with them on negotiating like a new way of life in France, essentially. Like, yeah, that's- and I want to stress like how important this is Nowadays, in social movements and revolutions across the world, this concept is like, we just take it for granted, this concept right. of the people, right? Right. The people is supposed to mean like all of the common people against the state or against the government or against like whatever that's yeah. born in the French Revolution. Like we said in America and the American War for Independence, the people like was not a thing. It was the elites running the show. Right. I mean, they, they definitely said they were writing for the people. We yes, the people. They exactly. said they were writing for the people, but they did not get all of the people's like ascension on that right they didn't they didn't go and talk to slaves they didn't Mm -hmm. definitely talk to women especially if we want to reference abigail adams when she Mm -hmm. wrote to john and said we're still not going to listen to you but like they didn't yep yeah so okay they want to convene at versailles again but in this case the king louis the 16th refused to allow them to meet at versailles um he makes up an excuse but in reality he sees this new national assembly as very dangerous to his his absolute rule right Mm -hmm. um they decide instead that they're going to meet um, in protest on June twentieth at seventeen eighty or at seventeen on seven uh, in seventeen eighty nine. Um, they meet on June twentieth, seventeen eighty nine, and on a tennis court. And this is where they take the very famous tennis court oath, mm-hmm. not to separate and to reassemble wherever circumstances require until the constitution of the kingdom is established. So this oath means they're basically going to occupy this 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 private tennis court. 
um, as the National Assembly, and they're not going to leave until there is an actual constitution. At this point, it must be stated that the revolutionary process is seeking constitutional monarchy like England's, not a full-blown republic yet like what would become the United States. So they're, they're, mm-hmm. it's still, in that case, we would argue it's not quite as radical in that regard. Um, that's all they're seeking at this moment in time, a constitutional monarchy. Why is this tennis court, tennis court oath, God, I can't even speak today, um, so famous? It's the first, basically, declaration of the revolution. And, of course, there's a famous painting. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, if you Google... By like, the way, French if you're thinking, like, how did all these people meet at a tennis court? That's super weird. Think of, like, Wimbledon with huge, like, yeah. seats, like a stadium, yeah, this basically. isn't, like, your local park tennis yeah, court. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like a stadium, right? Yeah. Um, Louis ends up surrounding this court with 18,000 troops and a show of force, force to intimidate the National Assembly. And some of the clergy and nobility show up in support of either side. So you've got some clergy that su- are supporting the National Assembly. Then you've got other clergy that are like, King, like, why don't you just like end this now? Just mm-hmm. end it. Like, put these people down. Um, so definitely a little bit of that. While all this politicking is going on, though, for the actual people, the economy was getting worse. More and more people are going without food. A lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people, if you're in the middle class, you're losing your job. You're losing your way to make a living. It's getting worse and worse for them. It's not just about, like, less buying power for certain people It's or feeling unrepresented. It's, it's becoming very quickly life or death. Yeah. Like, that's really what it's and about. People are literally starving. Yeah. Um, low crop yields essentially mean there's no food for consumption or sale. So even if you happen to be like a farmer that had enough crops that you could not only feed your family, but take them to market or whatever, you now don't even have that. And so if you can't take them to market, you can't, of course, turn a sale on them and buy other products that you might have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's really being felt all up and down like the the, the class-based system here at this point in time. Or even if you're wealthy, you can't buy any thing. Well, yeah, and you can't even, yeah. So even the bourgeoisie, which is a term that will become paramount here in a little bit even those jobs begin to evaporate Mm -hmm. because like if if the bottom of the quote-unquote pyramid is struggling like the rest all will collapse and i think that's what a lot of modern economists seem to forget too but whatever um okay Amid this controversy, Jacques Necker is dismissed again, now for a second time. He was serving as finance minister because of, like, his popularity among the people, but he ends up being dismissed by the nobility and the king again. His dismissal is met with massive riots, looting and an open rebellion in Paris. Like, again, this is just a guy. He's just an economist of the era. He was, a you know, a first a comptroller, and then he's a finance minister, Is his dismissal really the reason, like, these riots break out in Paris? They might be the match, but are they the actual reason? No, I mean, the the people are experiencing real hardships and are starting to have real legitimate grievances with the government. So this is just... They like the dude because he seems reasonable from the right. people's perspective. So, yeah, they're pissed that he gets dismissed. But there's a whole, so much more behind their riots. The most famous part of these riots um, is the storming of the Bastille. Mm-hmm. And that takes place on July 14th, 1789. Still celebrated July 14th as Bastille Day to this day in France. Um, essentially, the Bastille was a fortress slash prison that held weapons. It held seven political prisoners. Um, but mostly important, the storming of this was about the symbol. Yes, they do get weapons. Revolutionaries require weapons Mm -hmm. um, if they are actually going to launch a revolution. Definitely have to do that if you're going to take on the state. It's also cool to free seven political prisoners. But really, it's about the symbolism of of this this actual, like, physical place. We talk about monumentality before in, like, past, like— uh, 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 episodes of our podcast here about monumentality and what it means to build like these symbols, whatever these symbols might be, great walls or statues of liberties or Mount Rushmore's or whatever they are. But in this case, this symbol, this monument, this monumentality is actually going to be deconstructed, which is yeah, symbolic for what reason? Oppression. It's a symbol of oppression, being a prison where the state, I keep using the term the state, but technically I don't, we could argue if it was a state or not under the monarchy, but that's a whole right. other conversation. Anyways, Oppression by the government because it was holding political prisoners. It was a prison. So when they they storm this Bastille and they take it apart, they dismantle it over time, brick by brick. What are they? What is this symbolic for? De- deconstructing the oppression. Absolutely. I always like to talk about how the French today still. I mean, like you said, this is still their like day of independence that we would think of it, right? Right. That like, like what did you do on like your day? Like, oh our history is we stormed and completely deconstructed this building like brick by brick and like, Oh, in America, what did you do? Well, we signed a document. (laughs) (laughs) I always think it's funny. That's dope. (laughs) 
Oh, I love that. I actually, all right, whatever. All right, more symbolism, much more bloody symbolism in this case. The governor um, of this like part uh, in where the Bastille was, Governor De Launay, ends up decapitated. Um, his head is then placed on a pike and then paraded around in celebration. Uh, I don't know that we're like, you know, super into that, but it happened. Uh, the symbolism here is literally the decapitation of oppression in this yeah. case, I suppose. I mean, it's going to get worse. So. Yeah, well, it is definitely going to be decapitation's a thing here in the French Revolution. So uh, the mayor, De Flesse, uh, also ends up flesse? anyway god my French sucks anyway he ends up also being butchered by the mob during this period of time and it is after the storming of the Bastille in this like kind of like suburb we would call it like a suburb of Paris where Paris forms itself into a commune under the leadership of the Marquis de Lafayette who's this guy he's not just a random he's not just no. a rando who is this guy and he's a military leader that fought in the American War for Independence he already has a background, clearly, in, in, in working um, with uh, uh, George Washington and, to a lesser extent, like Jefferson and so on and so forth. Maybe even Hamilton, although I think that musical took some liberties. Oh, God, I forgot that he was in. Yeah. Yeah, that, that musical Lots took a lot liberties. of liberties yeah. regarding the relationship between, like, Lafayette and Hamilton and, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other liberties, which we have episodes on. But regardless, yes, long story short, this dude has um, both military-like credentials and um, revolutionary credentials because of what he did in the war, uh, American War for Independence. We talk about a lot about the transferring of ideology, like, globally, and right. in this case, revolutionary ideology. Lafayette is, like, the impersonation... Uh, personification of that because he literally fought in the American War for Independence, then went back to France. So some of the revolutionary like way of thinking, um, Thomas Paine is another example. Yeah, even if we would argue that the American War for Independence wasn't as revolutionary as the French Revolution, there were certainly fresh, uh, there were revolutionary ideals floating around what for would sure. become the United States. And even though those got eventually uh, muted by more, um, to be blunt, conservative policymakers, mm -hmm. there the ideals were here, and so Lafayette would have had them yep. for sure brought them over to France. Anyway, a commune forms, a Paris commune forms under Lafayette, and it is not, for our more left-leaning uh, listeners, it's not the very famous Paris commune that you might be thinking of of the mid-1800s. It's but like they, the OG Paris commune. Yeah, this is the OG Paris commune, right? Okay, anyway, this commune kind of forces the king to back down amid all of the violence that was taking place in, in, in Paris, and he concedes to accept something called the Tricolor on July 17th. Um, of that year, 1789. What is the tricolor? It's the flag. The tricolor. Is. Why is the flag significant? It is the color. It is the one of the most famous flags in the world. It is the French national flag. But why is this so significant, accepting this flag? What does this flag mean? This, we're talking symbolism here. The French Revolution yeah. is a symbol. I don't think I can stress enough the importance of this as a symbol. Prior to this, it was standard, I mean, really across the globe, but definitely in France and in most of Europe, that the sort of symbol of the government and the rulers was the family crest of, in this case, the king, mm -hmm. right? So by accepting this flag as a symbol of the government, that's a huge, huge shift in like the recognition of the people and some sort of transition. And essentially, this flag will come to represent, like, not just three estates, because it's three colors, but this new national identity that is yep. forming. We're not, I'm not going to talk nationalism yet. We'll get there. But this is kind of like its infancy. This flag is representing a new identity that the revolutionaries will seek to replace the old identities with. You are no longer a serf. You are French. You are no longer just a whatever, I, I, I don't know, a, a, a baron or whatever. It's not just about your chateau. You, everything is for the nation. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that, 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 that yeah, whatever. And the Verge Chateau is just funny. I don't know why. So yeah. much French. God damn it. Okay, anyway. So um, blue um, is the color of, like, is tr has been the traditional color of France. Um, and then red was the color of, like, the militia that ended up storming the Bastille. They wore this, like, thing on their heads. And, and so those colors are representing both, like, the tradition of Paris, like, being, like, the, 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 the urban center of everything French. Um, and then the red being the colors of like revolutionary cause, i.e. the stormers of the Bastille. And then white was the traditional color of like all of the French, like French countryside, the hinterlands and so on and so forth. So merging these three elements is where they came up with like these colors. So blue, uh, blue, white, and red, red, white, and blue, white, red, and blue, whatever. You get the idea. Well, technically white's in the middle. So damn it. So white would have always been in the middle. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, the king uh, is forced to accept this on July 17th of 1789, and it is wildly symbolic. We'll talk more about the national symbolism here in a second. 
Many of the nobles during this time um, saw like the writing on the wall in Paris, and they end up like fleeing. And they end up fleeing to go try and like reconvene and fund what was going to become a counter revolution. And there are counter revolutions, which, if a counter revolution exists, that means the revolution must be significant enough um, mm -hmm. to be like revolutionary. Rural peasantry also began to follow suit with like their urban compatriots. So they kind of, they're not watching because they're far away, but they're kind of hearing what's going on in Paris in these like rural countrysides at the chateaus, chateau, at the chateaus. Um, and they begin to follow suit. And without really um, any sort of like organized directive of the National Assembly, because again, they're, this is the 1700s, they're not like on the phone communicating they begin to just seize the quote-unquote means of their production. They take the, cha they take the chateaus, mm -hmm. of which sometimes they've worked under for centuries and centuries, like generationally, like these serfs or peasants have had these relationships with their lords, um, and they just seize them. They yep. seize their means of production, which again, you know, Karl Marx hasn't been born for another, like, I don't even know, a couple of decades at this point, but this is important. Why is, what, essentially... Walk me through why serfs and peasants seizing chateaus is not just symbolic, but materially important. I don't know if it is actually that materially important. It's definitely symbolic because the structure of serfdom, of feudalism, is, right? There would be a central manor where the lord would live. And I mean, these estates, were, were could, some of them were, I mean, massive, right? Like you would travel for a day or something or more to get from your portion of the land as a serf to the manor. Um, and so it was like where the owner, the landlord lived and where your lord lived and their family lived. And so by seizing this, you're essentially seizing the center of power of your individual estate on which you live. Materially, I, there wasn't a lot of production that was done at the actual manor because it was all done out wherever the serfs were living right. on their land. So materially, I don't know if it's that significant, but symbolically, definitely for sure. This leads to a time in the French Revolution known as the Great Fear, where essentially like both sides, both like peasants and like aristocracy are, are creating rumors about the other and both are wildly scared of the other because of these rumors. So essentially the aristocracy is creating this fear among other ar aristocrats, basically saying like these peasants are seizing manners and beheading people burning and, them down and, and burning yeah. down like these entire like again chateaus, um, where in reverse the peasants themselves are spreading rumors of how their aristocrats are their lords essentially the nobility are uh, and intentionally like starving them now so this is the time that, that in the french revolution we know is the great fear and this it's is kind of weird that this is like almost like propaganda right where like the serfs are hearing rumors that the nobility is that responsible for the famine and that's why they're all starving right which is not the case right and then the nobility is hearing rumors that the serfs are seizing and burning down manors and etc i'm sure that that happened but it was very very isolated so that's really not the case either and so they're both terrified of each other based on like fake news really no absolutely and both real and imagined oppression taking place in the countryside eventually does catch the attention of the national assembly and in their august decrees again of 1789 this is all happening like 1789 in their august decrees they officially abolish feudalism how do they officially abolish feudalism all serf laws some of which have like i said been around for centuries like centuries at this point this isn't just like a cute little relationship between an island and a, a continent based on colonialism these are entrenched this is what makes the french revolution a little bit more radical in our opinion as well is they're overthrowing institutions that at times are even like a thousand years old exactly yep um they abolish. They abolish the serf laws. They abolish tith forced tithing. They abolished mandatory labor among both the serb, uh, serf and peasant class, and they abolish bondage to land. So a lot of these serfs were bond, or like like bonded to like land, regardless of what lord came in and either passed down his land or eventually sold it to another. You were bound to that land, and, and generationally, was, yeah, yeah, and you're bound to work it. And of course, what do you get in return? What was what was feudalism selling these serfs or these peasants? What do you get Protection. in return? Yeah. protection um and if you happen to have a nice lord maybe a little bit of chance to to make a profit and go to market and you know buy something mm -hmm. cute for yourself but in reality you were it was exploitation it was labor mm -hmm. exploitation um which is interesting to think about when we talk about like does the french revolution end labor exploitation it does not but we'll get right. to that um interestingly enough it, it no just changes it. That yeah yet. it just we're changes it. it just yeah. changes it um okay anyway they also basically break things up 
Um, they break things up among like local governments around France. France had been basically separated, or at least French territory. It's not formally what we would call France yet, but French territory had been under 13 regional parliaments, for lack of a better term, like little governments. They had those like they had local laws that they would create there, just like in any provincial like provincial system. Those were suspended during this time by the National Assembly as well because they tended to be, again, very conservative, very pro-aristocrat. They were usually only like occupied or manned by aristocrats. So those were also su- suspended during this period I mean, Let's of time. be honest, no serf had any political position. That was Not in any of these regional, these 13 regional parliaments. Absolutely not. This is where we get one of the most radical documents of the time period um, um, actually published. It's called The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And in our, like, my long-winded, like, intro or overview of the French Revolution, I read one of the um, parts, the second part of the uh, Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, but it becomes a thing on August 26th of 1789. It was drafted by the Marquis de Lafayette. With or without Thomas Jefferson is debatable. I'm assuming Jefferson probably had a little bit of influence on some of the documentation, but it's interesting to note, and we've already discussed this in in the intro to this episode, that the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen are exponentially more radical uh, than the United States Bill of Rights. So if Jefferson, if Thomas Jefferson had any sort of influence on this document is this him like is this an outlet for his more radical views that he did not get to engage in here in the u.s what do you think i guess it's possible i mean jefferson was like one of the more like i don't even know if i want to call him radical but one of the more radical founding fathers right i'm not a fan by any stretch of imagination of this guy and his his views on on slavery and uh um war on indigenous people though some people do like to cite that he was at least philosophically willing to entertain radicalism for his time right. practically he never did and for mm-hmm. me this makes thomas jefferson one of like the great examples of the hypocritical sellout so uh interesting though he's the one that like all of the founding fathers abandoned Thomas Paine except for Thomas Jefferson, and he's the he one he did that, for a little bit, but then they came. Yeah, they, yeah, they, he, they hurt, yeah. he's the one that brings him back to right. America, and and he does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, let me give Jefferson a little bit of credit. No, he's but still a piece st- of yeah, shit, yeah. But right, right, he's got right, a couple right, of good. You try to whatever, <laughs> man. Like, all right. Okay, so we're only going to read a couple of these, like from the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, but we we have to. We ha- it, it is a landmark document, and I cannot stress how much of a landmark document it is. A good portion of the modern constitutions around the world have this as like their preamble, um, not just like former French colonies, but like a whole bunch of other nations that have looked at this document and chosen it at, because of what it says. It is part of the United Nations um, founding charter. That's how radical this document is. So again, Americans like to pat themselves on the back for their l- little bill of rights and whatever, but this is the document that the rest of the world really cares about. So let's talk about a couple of these concepts in here. Okay. First article in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be found only upon the general good. Real quick, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. This is very different because of the language. What do we say here in the United States? What were we saying in the United States? Created. Right off the bat. We say men are created. What's the difference? One of them implies a higher being that very clearly is responsible for the creation. In France, they don't have any of that. It's men are born yeah yeah separation of church and state how's that going Mm -hmm. um not a thing not a real thing we like it's a pipe dream but regardless france at this point is challenging um to be blunt catholic power yep they would have wanted that term created in there Mm -hmm. um and nope not in this case here's the other key to this first article they remain free what did this lead to conversations about before any other european country slavery They began to have conversations about slavery, Mm -hmm. and they began to work on abolishing slavery, again, so much longer before than like England or the United States or or Spain or whoever else. They started this process before, I think, every other country in Europe. I'm not sure on the Dutch. I'd have to look that one up. But regardless, they started this process very early on. Mm -hmm. This isn't just giving the French a little bit of credit for finally trying to like, I don't know, have some sort of morals or ethics to the way their their economy worked. But it also is important for like revolutionary trajectory because it is these conversations that were taking place in Paris that would make their way to one of France's colonies, mm-hmm. uh, Saint Domingue or Saint Domingue, um, uh, basically what we would call Haiti. Yep. 
And it is these conversations that uh, really, we could argue, founded the ideals of the Haitian Revolution, one of the most overlooked revolutions in, in the modern era, if, if we had to argue that. Okay. And it's, it's, it's one of the few examples that super critical revolutionary historians like myself um, or revolutionary sociologists like Nick would argue where it, it, we might be able to argue that the bottom of the pyramid actually engaged in in a, a, a attempts at toppling the pyramid rather than it being like more of a middle class or like a bourgeois revolution like most revolutions tend to be in this case actual slaves were liberating themselves yep. so it's wildly important revolution mm -hmm. anyway the second part of that first article social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good what's that mean I mean, it's basically saying that institutionalized hierarchy can only exist if it's good for everyone and society why is that different than, again, the other Enlightenment era revolution of the yeah. era? I mean, they don't need to talk about this. Era. They don't talk about this at all, really. I mean, they, they say that you have the right to the pursuit of things, but they don't actually outlaw institutional hierarchy of any kind. Right. It's actually built into the system. Right. It's, it, it, the, the United States found it, foundational documents are very individualistic, very myopic, and all about, like, stuff. I mean, like, basically, there's social is, distinction. Right? You, like, have the, you have the right to pursue whatever you want within this very rigid hierarchical structure Yes, that is instilled through the law of our land. Right. France is much, much different. And only if that. you are what? Yeah, white or male or land-owning or... Yeah, 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 we could go on and on. Yeah, we could go on and on down the line. This one states social distinctions will exist. So they're not creating some sort of like Enlightenment-era communism here. That's not what we're insinuating. There are going to be social distinctions. Those will still persist, but only if those social distinctions are to the benefit of every French citizen. Mm -hmm. Hugely important. The aim of all political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. We already talked about this one, but the rights are liberty... And here's the one that I always hate, of course, property, but let's talk about it. Why is property such a hot topic in the Enlightenment era? Like, well, obviously, um, it, it, it was part of the U.S. narrative, but like... From the French perspective, I could see where, like, even this coming from the serfs, right, where they haven't had the right to own property, um, really, in their history. It's so huge in French philosophy, I mean, in the Enlightenment era period, but in French philosophy as a result of Rousseau and the social contract and the ideas of proper, it, the importance of property it being part of government and the commonality between man and, yeah, agreeing to the social contract and so forth. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing that 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 idea of resistance to oppression that we touched upon in like the overview or the intro part of, of this episode. That's important here. There is there there is no honestly, there's no checks to that resistance to oppression. When we look at why Paris to this day, if you're watching the news is on fire every couple of months, it's part of the protection under this second article here, this resistance to oppression. It gives the French people the right to be a lot more radical than other people around the world, including, of course, uh, Americans who think, again, we can do a whole lot of things. And in fact, and, and Nick used this term. There's a very narrow scope for you to pursue happiness. Well, the First Amendment gives you a very narrow scope to basically petition the government for your redress of grievances here in the United States. You cannot do a whole hell of a lot to question authority here. Wow, you can protest. Here, it's not limited to that protest. This, yeah, peaceable, this peaceable assembly. You have the outright right to resist oppression. When we teach this class in, with our students, this our revolutions class, we tell them when we do this unit— we guarantee you before this semester is over, there will be a protest or a riot in France. And we've been teaching that class for six or seven years now, and every single time it's true. Well, Which is I ironic. We talk about all the time, like, the stereotype of the French being, like, sissies and surrendering and, like, blah, blah, blah. But, like, it's complete bullshit. They go so hard in the yeah. streets. Yeah, I hate that. I hate that, like, American perception of, of the French. And I'm sure there's numerous stereotypes that the French direct right back right back at the United States. But that one of, like, surrendering, and uh, yeah. it's just a joke. I mean, this country that we're recording in right now would not exist without the French. Exactly. Like, so, anyway, 
Uh, the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. Number three is arguably the most important. Even though we went through two that were super important for a whole host of reasons, number three is big. Number three introduces the idea of what to the world? Nationalism. Nationalism. The nation. No longer is it about this overly complex, or maybe now it might seem simplistic, notion of, of like land bondage and feudalism and where the Catholic Church fits in. and so, none, none of that matters anymore. We are a united nation. We have stripped you of your identity, French people. We stripped it from you. you in fact, for some of you, the, even though we're like liberating you, this might be kind of scary because yeah, you've, sure. you've already you've always known who you were, who you owe your service to, who's going to keep you safe, who's going to keep you protected. You've known that for generations at this point, and overnight it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's gone. You no longer owe your allegiance to kings or lords, and the church is no longer a big player in your life if you don't want it to be. So yeah, now you have we... a new thing to be. You're French. This yeah. is the construction of a national identity which did not exist before in any part of the world, including the United States. After that war for independence, you were Bostonian, you were Virginian, you were Georgian, whatever you were, but you were not American. That, was, that identity had to be constructed too over time, and the only reason it was constructed is by influence from this revolution across the Atlantic. So now we see a reverse, reflexive influence from the French Revolution. Yeah, I, I think people often overlook this idea uh, in the French Revolution of it's not just that they overthrew absolutism or they overthrew their economic system, which was feudalism at the time, but they completely deconstructed their, the very identity of who they were as people. You were no longer a serf. You were no longer a noble. You were no longer these things you now, in this case, were French. And then they had to manufacture what that identity was. And it takes time to manufacture it. It doesn't happen overnight, but this is the start of it. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll go through, I mean, we can't go through this whole list of of rights. We'll be here all day. There's good ones. Number four says, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. I like that line. Mm -hmm. Um, It gives you freedom, but as long as your freedom is not infringing upon another person's freedom, this is also surrounding like arguments regarding slavery like that. We can see that here. Also, we see like the birth of the idea of libertarianism as a thing like comes out of France largely as a result of like this way of thinking. Right. Proudhon and like others. Law can only prohibit such actions that are hurtful to society. So we're not going to just create laws for law's sake, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. But regardless, we're not just going to manufacture laws for no reason to benefit only like a certain people or a certain type of society. Laws will only be created uh, to prevent actions that are hurtful to France, the French people. Right. So anyway, it goes on and on, and, and, and we highly recommend you checking out all 17 of these original, like, articles from the Rights of Man and the Citizen um, from 1789. It actually blows my mind that, like, like, I get that our education system is highly Americanized, but that, like, this isn't required reading for the curriculum in the U.S., the history curriculum. It blows my mind. The history curriculum is, is a joke. It's yeah, like, a, it's, a, it's, it's a global ridiculous. joke at this point. We are the laughing stock. It, whatever. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Um, okay. Let's start talking about women. This is one thing that we can agree uh, France was just as bad as the United States on regarding its revolutionary process. Women played an absolutely important role in the revolutionary process, and yet when the revolution was won, they were again forgotten and discarded. So in this case, France and the United States are on the same same page in regarding uh, patriarch and misogyny. They're both wildly problematic here. But let's talk about at least the positive aspect first, what women actually did in the revolutionary process. The most famous one, or the most famous contribution took place on October 5th of 1789. It was the Women's March on Versailles, where over 7,000 women marched to the, the, the palace, the opulent palace of Louis, and of course, Marie Antoinette, who we have not brought up yet, but um, they march. This march began in basically like the markets around Paris where bread was unaffordable. Crowds began to form. There were like drum rolls, like like musicians showed up to like like really rile these women up um, um, because they're starving. Like they cannot afford to eat and they cannot... I mean, they can't afford to buy bread. Bread's mm-hmm. like cheap. It's it's supposed to be one of the cheap staple foods that really anyone can kind of get, and they can't afford it. They can't afford it because the, the prices have gone too high because of all of the things we've talked about, right? Yep. A, they're overtaxed. B, um, production, like supply is down, obviously, so demand obviously goes up, and they can no longer afford it. Um, Look at you being the economist. Over I there. hate being. I hate supply demand <laughs> economics. It's all it's all manufactured. It's all a lie. No, just, um, anyway, okay. 
These marchers then move on to City Hall of Paris, where Lafayette led men out to basically tell these women to, to, to calm down. That, I mean, it was so patronizing, and that's mm-hmm. where the word really comes from. For Lafayette, this revolutionary thinker, to come out to these women who, in some cases, their kids are starving, and say, hey, you just need to calm down. This, we'll take care of this. Like, let, let the men do the work. Like, con- uh, Yeah, it's an example of, like, Dude. for all of his radicalism, it was this one thing, like, he was yeah. completely incapable of. Anyway, See. well, it's it's the start of his downfall, too, and it shows right. him to be much less radical than, than we hoped he would become. Anyway, his men end up actually siding with the women. They're like, dude, like, these, like, maybe in some cases, like, I know these women. Like, mm-hmm. we, like, their concerns are real, and you need to address them, like, right fucking now. Um, so, anyway, his men begin to support women, and riots and looting begin to take place throughout Paris. I love looting. I know that's not super popular to say here in the United States because there's like this weird like countercultural notion of like what looting means. Looting is actually just like a it, it's it's not about property. It's actually a symbolic act taken part. And I'm not saying like every looter like really engages in this like deep philosophical like discussion in their head about looting, but it is basically <laughs> right. like the symbol of socioeconomic inequality and a reaction to that socioeconomic inequality. Like that's what mm-hmm. it is, right? Your society, whatever your society is, has created like these weird like status symbols, or maybe in some cases like real material symbols that are required for survival. And in this case, when opportunity strikes, yes, you've been taught your whole life, like this is what success means, or this is how I get by. You're going to do whatever it takes during this process to get that. Mm-hmm. Like that's that, but I haven't had access to it until now. So it, that's a whole different conversation. We should do an episode on looting specifically. That'd be awesome. All right, whatever. They begin to demand bread, the dismissal of the royal guard. These women demand bread, dismissal of the royal guard, and to move the court back to Paris so that they can be um, held accountable for like the the horrors of the French economy. Um, meetings with the assembly and, ki- and the king eventually uh, yielded very hollow promises by the um, absolute. Um, um, the absolutist government, though Louis does during this time, during the Women's March, get forced to accept the Declaration of Rights of Man, of which we just went over, and the citizens. So it's actually the Women's March that leads to him basically formally adopting the ideals, or at least saying he's adopting the ideals, of the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. That's powerful. No, yeah, and the women are, don't get enough credit for kind for of sure. like leading this charge. It's kind of like the Daughters of Liberty and the War for Independence. No one's ever even heard of them. You right. know what I mean? Violence breaks out um, on this march, and the palace eventually is stormed by, like, women and other, at this point, revolutionaries that have joined their march to Versailles. And there are a number of different casualties until Lafayette eventually diffuses the situation. But I want to talk about this real quickly, because why did they choose Versailles as a place to march? Aside from that's where the king and queen were hanging out. But why did they choose Versailles for this march? What is Versailles? We're back to symbolism. Yeah, it's a massive symbol of the opulence and just the absolute overconsumption by the royalty in this case if you've never been there i mean just google a picture of it it is massive and there's literally like golden hallways and it's just ridiculous so people are starving and yet the king and queen get to live this way Mm -hmm. not only Um, live it but like it's being built at the time like built out and like they're like doing construction on it and like it's ridiculous it it was started uh by under under louis the 14th but Mm -hmm. yes it had gone it had been it had consistently gotten more opulent through louis the 15th through louis the 16th and that was what was taking place moreover the queen's there and what does the queen represent she represents absolute just luxury and just yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, I hate the fact that so many people try and like humanize her and stuff. Like I get she was a living, breathing person and had her own wants and needs and life's hard being an aristocrat and being married away from Austria to France. But like whatever, dude. Mm-hmm. Like you are like the symbol of ev- everything that's wrong with France. Like well, you not have, only that, but like her behavior reflected that, right? With like her wild gambling parties. Well, and, that's like, the point. Yeah. Like, like you, you're so disconnected from society. And this is where we get the very famous line, let them eat cake. No, guys, she never really said that. But the fact that like she was so symbolic in her disconnectedness from the French people, that's where the rumor or the propaganda at the time comes from. Like this idea that that this 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 royal moron has so little idea what's going on around her that she's like, well, if they don't have bread, why don't they just eat cake? Like that's right. where this rumor comes from. And yeah, again, like she, you said, she never said it, but it definitely like is something she might have said, right? Like she was that right. ridiculous. Right. Yeah, well, she'll she'll pay for it later. Yeah. Um, but anyway, okay. The constitutional monarchy is ushered in because of this, like, women's march. And Louis ends up adopting the declaration, and we have, um, in, from basically 1791 on, a constitutional monarchy, although that, that will change here in a little bit, too. The National Assembly and the major events above, basic, or above, that I just got done talking about, man, my notes. Anyway, 
the major events that I ju- just got done talking about eventually forced Louis to recognize a formal constitution as well as the Declaration of Rights of Man. And this is where we see like an actual constitutional monarchy. Um, debates were never really settled during this time period on what constituted citizenship um, and what constituted an active citizen versus a passive citizen versus a female citizen. And that's one of the reasons we have to kind of call out this part of the revolution as being still a little bit too conservative for our liking, right? Mm-hmm. Like at this point, even after um, this these great actions, only 4 million men in France after these had access to the government. So this part of the revolution still it falls under that traditional Enlightenment era um, critique that we provide for the American War for Independence. It was wildly unrepresentative, even though it claimed to be. It will get better, but at this part, the constitutional monarchy was at, not at that level yet. One of the things that they really did, though, during this time period that is important is they liberalized the economy to appeal to the Parisian bourgeoisie class um, and they began to suppress like workers' organizations. We don't want to call them unions. They're not unions as we would call them, but like guilds, guilds that, that had honestly existed in some cases for centuries. This economic liberalization, um, some might argue, is, is really the globalization of, an, of a proto-capitalism, for lack of a better term. Some might argue that capitalism actually predates this by, by centuries. It's really an ideological or philosophical debate I don't feel like having right now. But what we would argue is the full-blown like liberalization of the economy in France and that, that spread to where France is going to conquer and its wars, for, uh, wars against tyranny, this is important. Um, but this is more in the wheelhouse of Nick. Why is economic liberalization during the constitutional monarchy period important in terms of, like, honestly revolutionizing France? I mean, we might not be fans personally of economic liberalization to this level, mm-hmm. but it is change, and change means revolutionary. So uh, when they abolish feudalism, like very clearly some other economic system has to take its place so that the people can survive and that they can have some you know, way of supplying the sustenance for their people. The materialists would argue, so we've talked about like, right, structuralism in the revolutionary theory and the global wars and the famine and et cetera. A materialist would look at this and say this is really the story of the contradiction between the feudal mode of production and the like neat i don't want to say capitalism yet like you said but this burgeoning new form of sort of capitalist production and you mentioned the bourgeoisie and the role of the guilds at this time like you said some of the guilds have been around for centuries and they were starting to gain an incredible amount of economic power that wasn't actually able to translate into political power yet, though that is happening at this time as well as a result of the revolution. So many people posit this as like the contradiction between the guilds and the bourgeoisie who were like proto-capitalists at this point, like mercantilism, et cetera, which we won't go into right now, and the nobility from feudalism that still had control of the majority of the land and had incredible political power. So this economic sort of contradiction is playing itself out through this revolution as well so liberalizing of the economy is i don't want to call it a free market even though that you can think of it as sort of being like a free market of the time but it's like a proto version of capitalism so the ideology changes from feudalism to this proto-capitalism that we don't necessarily want a full-blown like label and that is revolutionary change what does not change however is exploitation of labor, and that's what we got exactly. to talk about. Now, you may not be bound to land by, like, you know, both written and oral contracts for generations. You're now bound to a different economic system and a different type of servitude. It's Now, instead simple- of being exploited by the landlords, you're now exploited by the bourgeoisie who own right. the businesses and so on. Right, and that's where that exploitation takes place. And here's the thing. We all know in a free market society, it takes money to make money. So if you were one of the nobility that at least survived parts of the revolutionary process with a good portion of your material assets, when this new economy burgeons and there is time for reinvestment in whatever businesses in the urban areas or land in the rural areas— yes, everybody's free to pursue, but you already have a leg up because it is a material-based economy. You already have something to invest. Whereas the recently freed surf, yes, might be free now and free to do whatever they want. Like this is like the, the biggest jack-off discussion that happens in like free market art, uh, in free market discussions. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody's free and you can just do whatever you want. Yeah, but some people are starting from different points on like the proverbial like ladder. Like some people are starting with assets that they can invest in. And if you're starting with none, you're going to be behind forever and then end up like having to sell your labor to those mm-hmm. people that started from a different point on the quote-unquote racetrack of life 
Um, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 an absolute joke. But that's for an, again a different episode. Moving on. We have a long list of episodes. Going yeah. On, holy right? shit! The French Revolution really <laughs> brings up a whole bunch of things. Well, here's the thing with nationalism. I'm going to talk a little bit more about nationalism here coming up. But but we already actually have other episodes on nationalism. We have one specifically, a short one, only ten minutes or so on like how nationalism spreads during the French Revolution. So check that one out on our channel. We already have that one. But one of the things that happens during this time period, the constitutional monarchy period, is that church property ends up nationalized. And like I said, the French Revolution may have abolished uh, eventually absolutism and feudalism. It doesn't abolish the Catholic Church. It just subordinates it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they chose not to fully like uh, just end Catholicism in France? Like, Why do you think they at least allowed it to, ex to, to exist still? Even, even if the country became less religious, let's be blunt, yeah. they did. I mean, some people still viewed it as, uh, many people, as a key component of their identity. Also, many more people would have been pissed off if they fully tried to like run the Catholic Church out of the country. Well, and that's what they do. Well, that, that's not what they do. But they keep the church around, but they nationalize its property and its offices. So I mean, if, that pisses enough people right, off. Right. So if you're going to be a church operating in this, this territory we're now just calling France, right, like then you are going to—you exist, just like the, the Declaration of Rights man said. You exist to support the nation. Mm -hmm. So they become very nationalistic in this regard as totally. well. Um, and most people don't know that to this day the Catholic Church is still the largest landowner on the earth. Right. Well— I think the pentagon's closing in on them but um <laughs> yeah i think it, anyway god that's sad <laughs> it is sad but i mean i mean think about all the military bases yeah. everywhere like all right many um freedom of religion um is given to like state minority protestants and even jewish citizens that is another thing that the uh constitutional uh, monarchy period like presents and a lot of french like obviously conservative French thinkers really dislike that. Why do they not want Protestants to be able to freely worship or Jewish uh, folks to freely worship in, within the borders of France? Um, well, that conversation goes back like centuries, um, that there's xenophobia and yeah, it's whatever. Anyway, church life do does fade away through the revolution. Churches exist, but more in just like a nostalgic way i would argue i mean like it's just kind of yeah whatever the pope does he's like watching what's going down from rome and and he's basically condemning this revolution with all of the power of like nothingness now he's not the pope of like the middle ages like could like call full-on armies and take things down he's pretty flaccid but mm -hmm. he's like condemning it so that's cool i guess neat guy um factions do begin to materialize during this time period in the uh, uh constitutional assembly and i must stress this um, these factions, um, literally sat in like different sections of like the assembly rooms that they would be in. And the more like conservative minded, um, delegates would sit on like the right side of the room and the more radical, like revolutionary thinkers, uh, of this assembly would sit on the left side of the room and people that kind of sided, like, you know, they saw a little bit of themselves in both sides would sit in the middle. And this is literally the beginning of like what we would call left, right politics in Western thinking. Uh, most people don't know that. Um, but this is where the terms left and right come from is they come from the French revolution. Although they would be whatever the French versions of them are, but I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. know French, left and right is whatever. Okay. Anyway, um, more radical clubs um, to support the more radical left began to form in Paris, uh, especially in the urban, um, like the urban cool hip areas. What uh, uh, Jurgen Habermas would call like the public sphere, uh, which Nick should talk about here in a second. But I don't know. We'll see. Um, anyway, one of those more radical groups were, uh, were the Jacobins. Everyone knows the Jacobins. They were one of the most more radical leftist groups. I would argue not still as radical as, 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 as groups that come out like long after them. I, so like this whole kind of like fetishization of like the Jacobin movement, I think mm -hmm. is overdone in mm -hmm. the modern era. I don't think they're as radical as people like think they are, but regardless that they, they come, they come to fruition during this time period. King's still hanging out. He's growing uneasy with like instability. In his uh, in France, but he's also growing on your easy because the rest of the world, or the, well, the rest of Europe at least, is watching this, and international pressure from like French people living in other other kingdoms, or um, from like those the, the monarchs of other kingdoms themselves. There's a lot of pressure there on France to basically stop being so progressive. Like, why would these other monarchs around Europe, and even even the United States, is kind of watching and like. Mm -hmm. They're like, you need to slow this radicalism down. Like, again, because the United States was scared to death of what was happening in France. Let right. me just flat out say it. 
uh, by 1795 and 1796, they actually passed legislation to make it more difficult for French ideas to come here. They're known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Sedition Acts are related in that you cannot speak out your, to your government, like be, like what was going on in France. Like they, mm-hmm. they like the United States was willing to violate its First Amendment within like on, with under ten under ten years of it being like done because of what was going on in France. They no, were we have so an scared. On it. Oh yeah, we do have an episode on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh well, damn it. I'm done explaining it then. Look that one up. What were you thinking? Uh, Oh, why were the governments from around the rest of the world, at least Europe and the United States, so afraid of these ideas? It very clearly challenges their legitimacy, their leader's legitimacy. Absolutely. Um, Amid this, like, this, 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 like, international pressure, the king uh, and his queen and their court try to uh, flee to Austria, which, of course, is Marie's. uh, I actually was going to say, I'm surprised that every time I think about the timeline of this, I'm surprised that they even held out as long as they did. Like, you think they would have bounced much earlier than... I mean, they're going to pay for it, but... Well, yeah, they get caught. They, they try to flee to Austria. They get caught. Um, and, uh, and essentially, it's... Well, I guess I'll get into this part here. During this time period, as the king and queen are, like, kind of missing for a little bit, crowds had began to gather throughout Paris, and speeches were given by some very famous radical leaders to include, like, Danton, who we'll get to here in a second. Violence ensues, and Lafayette's forces end up coming in and, like, killing 50 of the more radical protesters, which forever, like, taints his name in the revolution. And again, it's another step on his, like, downfall as, like, revolutionary hero here is that he actually kills other revolutionaries for being a little bit more radical than him. Anyway, um, the National Assembly morphs its way, or Constitutional Assembly, into, like, the Legislative Assembly during this time period um, in a last-ditch effort to try and make this constitutional monarchy work. But international pressures, again, from places like the United States, Prussia, and Austria make uh, war possible and essentially destabilize the assembly as lines are being drawn. When I say make war possible, I mean not like war on your own people. I mean like war with other like nations. And one thing that will either galvanize or deconstruct a revolutionary process is an international war. Mm -hmm. In this case, in the French Revolution's case, it will further galvanize the revolutionary process when when they do go to war with these other countries that are trying to I mean, they're critiquing the revolution to such an extent that like like making, you said making war possible, right? Like they're threatening so much that it gives the revolutionaries... that's, reason to go to war. That's with a better way of saying that. Yeah, yeah totally, absolutely. Um, some examples of like these international pre- pressures come from some pretty famous people, like Edmund Burke in England. He's like hanging out. He wrote the famed Reflections on the Revolution in France, which are sensibly like shits all over the French Revolution. Then Paine writes and the a movement. response to that. Yep, which and, is pretty and, awesome. And Thomas Paine, you know, fires right back with basically the rights of man, not the the actual document we already read from, but but like his own like rhetorical essay shitting on Edmund Burke mm-hmm. um, and Payne's like basic yeah, philosophers used to shit on each other so much better than they do now like yeah we, now it, yeah whatever it's a whole other thing yeah it, yeah we're recording this well, I don't I we shouldn't date this episode never mind we'll move on anyway Thomas Paine, again, reveals some more of his radicalism here. And and for those of you that have kind of gone through our catalog, especially our episode on Thomas Paine and why the United States War for Independence was so not good enough for him, it really comes through in his essay, like Rights of Man, um, mm-hmm. where he, he is showing how much more radical he was than the eventual architects of the United States. Even though he's arguably one of the most important people in the American War for Independence, we don't consider him one of the architects because it, he was just too radical. And, and the other guys hated him because he was calling them out on their hypocrisy regarding slavery and women and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. You really see that here. In addition to, to, to Payne and, and his radicalism at the time, we cannot forget like Olympe de Gauche and what she was also uh, offering in terms of con- contributing to what we would basically now call first wave feminism. She's writing during this time period like the Declaration of Rights of Women and the Female Citizen in response to what's already been going on in France and the continued disenfranchisement of women. And like I said, I must stress, this is wildly important and influential. I mean, we've talked about like Abigail Adams here in the, in the United States and Wollstonecraft who wrote Vindication of Rights of Women in, in England. But here we see with, with de Gauche's writing that French women were also part of this, this process for basically female empowerment, but in fr- enfranchisement as full-blown citizens, which again, I think we forget that it's only been a couple of hundred years. That's how far behind Western civilization is in terms of gender equity. Like it's, it's actually embarrassing. I, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, I am too like, embarrassed. Yes. Like, 
Regardless, here's the question that, that, that we're trying to, to answer, though. We're really supposed to be talking about international pressure here. But regardless, could war actually stabilize the revolution? And in what ways would a war stabilize the revolution? The Jacobins and some of their rivals, the Gerondines, they, they're debating this in not just the assembly, but in that public sphere. Um, the war against absolutism eventually is voted on to go international. I guess what I want to ask you, Nick, is once like the assembly decides to basically take on these countries that are questioning them and they call it a war on absolutism, we all know how wars on like ideas go that, like, yeah, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. But this war on absolutism, they begin to launch against these like rival kingdoms. I guess I mean, I don't even know what question I'm trying to answer. You know what try, question I'm trying to ask you, but like, like, why? Why does this work, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, like you alluded to earlier, it creates solidarity. If there's any fragmentation going on or if there's big changes going on in the society, calling for war against some outside other, in this case, an idea, which is impossible to defeat, it creates solidarity and immediately galvanizes everyone. They begin with the invasion of the Austrian Netherlands, of course, because Austria was one of the kingdoms calling them out. And Austria was definitely calling out France for a very specific reason. I mean, Marie Antoinette is, is Austrian. She was right. Austrian. She was an Austrian princess. And this is the connection between Austria and France. And, and that's how dynastic rule worked in Europe for so mm-hmm. long. Um, one of the interesting like little asides here, and it ends up not being a little aside. It ends up being one of the bigger asides. At the time, I think it was a little aside, but it ends up being one of the most influential things from this time period and really bolsters this notion of nationalism was a little song that was written to like motivate the troops to go out and to be blunt, kill other people. And it was a song called La Marseille. And uh, it's written by Delisle. It is the world's first, for lack of a better term, in terms, it, it is the world's first national anthem. It becomes the world's first national anthem. It is arguably the most famous national anthem in the world today, you know, up there with the Russian Re- uh, anthem and the uh, Star Spangled Banner and so on and so forth. It's up there, right? And so La Marseillaise is like becomes this propaganda song to convince folks to basically join um, join the revolutionary process, join the mu- the new military, take up arms, and go like slaughter people that don't believe in what you say you believe for. I mean, it's one believe step it. in the manufacturing of the national identity. Which I mean, just slowly like building up. Yeah. Over time. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, just listen to the intro. <laughs> So in addition to like this, this kind of like national, I mean, man, I mean, don't you feel prideful now? Like after hearing that, I mean, I feel I'm prideful ready now. To go yeah. Ready. Water the fields with the blood of our Yeah, enemies. that line. Yeah. Oh, anyway. All right, moving on. But, <laughs> but it's important to know because like other nationalist projects eventually followed suit and, and it is, it is a, it's, in fact, why does music in this case, how does that in this case create unity but unity that is exclusionary like it's weird that you're trying to unify a certain people in their exceptionalism i mean you could argue that unity always creates exclusion right but why a song what is it about a song that does this it's almost like we're like uh, music hits us on so many different levels i mean it like burrows itself deep into your subconscious, right? Yeah, I've made no secret in any episode that I find nationalism to be one of the most appalling ideologies ever invented, and and so I'll probably reveal some of that here. But, like, I mean, think about, like, what this song... It's like we're, we're like Pavlov's dog, mm-hmm. and we're classically conditioned, oh, the minute that a song comes on, I'm going to stand up, and I put yeah. my... Like, gross like freaking gross like you're like be an individual be a thinker like think for yourself like uh, i don't know man like what but what is it about music that does that that i think is like different like even more so than maybe even imagery right i don't know no i think so yeah i would say that probably it's just it's it's very powerful and it's a very powerful piece of national identity in addition to imagery and the flags and language and food and so on 
Yeah. It's an important part of national culture. And it shows the hypocrisy that nationalism posits, especially in Republican-style governments. Like, you're, you're creating a republic here that supposedly values individual, like, uh, pursuits, and yet then you attach that to an identity that you're supposed to, like, just doggedly support among, you know, millions right. of other people, right? And never challenge that. Yeah. I mean, it's this contradiction between individualism and collectivism where, yeah— Exactly. It's literal groupthink. It's almost like a cult. Yeah. yeah anyway. Um, okay. In terms of domestic issues are concerned, um, there is still, like, through all of this, we've kind of left it by the wayside over the last, you know, whatever, 20, 30 minutes or whatever. The economic issues have persisted. So no matter what's going on regarding international pressure or a king and queen fleeing and then getting caught or these, like, philosophical discussions about, like, women's rights versus man's rights, the one thing that has persisted through all of this is the economy never got better. The economy never got better. So the revolution might be like changing people's ideals, but people are still suffering. So this is going to be a problem. Um, There was rampant inflation. There was rampant taxation. And the people, in this case, not even like the assembly, like more of the like lower middle class and lower classes began to like just revolt and riots were breaking out even against the revolutionary leaders because let me be blunt, people were still feeling deprived deprived of their most basic needs. Um, one of the palaces ends up stormed by ins- by the insurrectional National Guard, which forces Louis to seek shelter. He actually has to seek shelter with the assembly, because, and they're all together. So you have the Revolutionary Assembly, and then you have Louis all like kind of like hiding together from like these rioters. Um, massacres take place in the month of September of 1791. Between 1,000 and 1,500 prisoners were killed um, in case they happened to be siding with invading armies was the excuse. So if you happen to—so if, if the Austrian army or the Prussian army shows up, up. Uh, we're going to kill our political prisoners in case you end up accidentally siding with them. But really, the rationale was what? Like, what's the rationale? I mean, they're just killing any opposition at this point. Um, so colonial uprisings also became prominent during this time period, especially, of course, the one we've already mentioned uh, in Haiti and, and essentially like these slaves and these maroons and um, also free blacks in Haiti are, are basically liberating themselves and taking over, taking over like the colonial manners um, and seizing literally in their case, both the ideal and material means of production, which is super awesome. We love the Haitian Revolution. It's into this atmosphere in 1792 that the National Convention eventually is going to develop the First Republic. And this is what is going to, like, basically stabilize things at least for a little bit. Um, And it's probably, like, the last part of this, like, French revolutionary process we'll talk about because it ends with essentially, like, Napoleon seizing, seizing, like, all of it. But anyway, all right. By August of 1792... All male suffrage had brought together a new um, assembly um, from the old assemblies, basically now calling itself the National Convention. So we went from National Assembly to Constitutional Assembly to Legislative Assembly, and now we're at National Convention. It's basically like the same types of people just changing like their name and what like their role is in, in, in the government. But the far left are led by the Jacobins. And in this case, we start to have a couple of very like charismatic leaders. Most charismatic, of course, would be uh, Maximilien Robespierre, um, but also like Danton, who I've already brought out. Marat would be a very famous journalist slash politician. Um, these, these very like, again, I don't want to call them like architects in like the American sense, like we like call our like architects in fact most of these guys are going to be like later on like kind of crapped on by some of like french history Mm -hmm. but they are very important people that led to like the pushing forward of french revolutionary ideals that we can definitely say even if they didn't do so in the most um humane ways right i don't know Mm -hmm. international pressure eventually led to the conviction of both louis and marie of treason and they would both be executed i mean they would both be executed like this international i'm not saying the international community wanted them killed in fact the international pressure is what like led the decision for them to be killed is like if they're dead then there's nothing for like these other international actors to care about they're dead that was kind of the idea there yeah i think that's important is that the people from the outside like you said the international pressure was condemning the revolution to such an extent that the revolutionaries are like fine we'll just completely eliminate any possibility of bringing back the monarchy i mean like literally eliminate like all dumbass uh unwinnable wars against ideas um the revolutionaries were having a really hard time actually recruiting people like you think you have these amazing ideas and you got a cool flag and you even wrote a neat little song about it you still have trouble getting people to want to i don't know go out and kill or die for like these very like abstract ideas like especially when your national identity is like not even really a thing yet yeah 
Um, so just you're not like even killing for the country, right? At this point, you're no. You have nothing. Just like with George Washington's Continental Army, we're like, mm-hmm. oh man, everybody joined. No, he conscripted a good portion of that. Well, the same thing's going to happen here with the French um, yeah. um, Revolutionary Army that's going to wage its war on absolutism. They're going to conscript. It's called the levee en masse. And here's a quote about the levee en masse. The young men shall fight. The married men shall form, forge arms and transport provisions. The women shall make tents and clothes and shall serve in the hospitals. The children shall turn all lint into linen. The old men shall betake themselves to the public square in order to arouse the courage of the warriors and preach hatred of kings and the unity of the republic. So essentially this levee and mass doesn't just like take young dudes and throw them into the military. It's basically trying to like galvanize all of French society to be, to, it's almost, it's creating total war before total war. Like, right, we're not talking like World War One level total war, but like right. we're trying to, like all of society needs to be involved in this war on absolutism. Yep. It's crazy. Crazy talk. Okay. This leads, this time period gets us to one of the more famous parts of the revolution that we're, again, as we're kind of winding down here, the reign of terror between 1793 and 1794. A committee is formed. It is called the Committee of Public Safety. It is under the leadership of Robespierre. Let's talk about that name, the Committee of Public Safety. What is that name? I think I think about this all of the time, anytime, like, just like the Department of Homeland Security, right? Yeah. It makes you feel like they're protecting you, but very huh. clearly, like, it has ulterior motives. Yeah, go fuck yourself. Like, yeah. what is this? Like, that anyway. All right, okay. So what we have here is the revolutionary dictatorship, essentially, under Robespierre that forms because of the Committee of Public Safety. Basically, it's this idea that we've also talked about in other episodes in democratic processes. When things go wrong, people immediately go back and be like, one hero, come save us. Well, in this case, it's Robespierre. He uses this opportunity to get emergency dictator dicta- dictatorship powers. I was trying to say the word with the L at the end, but I can't spit that out. Thank you. Um, and essentially part of this was re- was based on economics. So it's during this time that he begins to fix prices, he fixes wages, and he seizes the crops to feed the masses. Um, I must stress this right here. This is actually one of the most revolutionary things that takes place. How is fixing prices and wages and their measurements, how is this revolutionary? Nick, what is, like, why is this one of the most revolutionary parts of the French Revolution that we don't even, most people don't even talk about? I mean, he has to stabilize society. It's going through such massive change. People literally still can't eat after all of this revolution. Something has to happen. So like you said, he seizes the crops and starts basically to control from the governmental, like quasi-governmental level, um, distribution and production of goods and resources. And he does this through the process of standardization, and that's the revolutionary part. What did he standardize? What is standardized in the French Revolution? Measurement. Measurement. We get what is known as now the metric system. Yes, that's how revolutionary the French Revolution was. Is it even changes how almost the entire world thinks about like length and weight and height and all of these other things. Like the metric system is a product of the French Revolution. And if you don't think the ideals of the French Revolution spread very far, we'll just look at the metric system. It's evidence that it did. It is though it is all around the world. At first to French's, France's enemies and then to its colonies. And of course, it is now the standard of measurement everywhere. Like that, the metric. Like the U.S. and one other country, if I remember correctly, that doesn't use the metric system. I mean, England's like fifty-fifty sometimes. Like you'll see some miles and stuff in there. Like, but yeah, yeah. I mean, officially as their government. It's I mean, because because it, it's literally called what is it in England? Not. I mean, they have the metric system for like most things, but then like what is it called? Like what's the other measurement? Like the imperial. imperial system. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway. Which I always thought was a funny name. Right. Right. But I mean, that's how influential the French Revolution is, is if, if, you, if you don't see like the spread of nationalism as influential and if you don't see the spread of liberalism as influential, like you can see like this very Enlightenment era scientific need to organize and categorize and uh, basically this very positivist thing mm-hmm. that is, is it reveals how influential the French Revolution was. All right. Anyway, we also see um, some interesting parts of propaganda take place. Some very famous like artistic pieces come from like the 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 war on tyranny slash like uh the reign of terror period one of the most famous pieces um art historians talk about from this time period is called the last moments of michelle le peltier by by 1790 or it by 17 by david in 1793 uh basically michelle le peltier was a a politician that was assassinated for voting in favor of executing louis basically one month after his death the parisian opera company performed like this 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 opera, the first martyr of the French Revolution. I guess I, I'll just ask this question real quickly: like, how is a play and a painting about a a dude 
basically being assassinated. How is this like propaganda? Like how is this propaganda? I'm always just amazed by the timeline of like how fast they were able to put together this opera and begin performing it. it. Every revolution must have its martyrs and these people start becoming the martyrs of the revolution over time. And in this case, it's spread through this painting and this opera about his death. And, and modern audiences might not get this. It's just a painting. How is this propaganda? Well, I mean, guys, like, they didn't have computers and TVs and all these, like, paintings were, like, the story, mm -hmm. uh, aside from, like, you know, pamphlets and things like that. I mean, but to absolutely dumb this down to a point that is painful for me, it's, like, the meme of the time, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that's actually really good. Even more meme of the time is uh, <laughs> The Death of Marat by yes. David. Marat was not just, like, a politician. He was also a journalist. He was radical left. Jean-Paul Marat was basically assassinated for supporting the Jacobins and leading the revolution in a more radical directions. And there were engravings of both of these paintings, whether it was Marat or uh, Le Peltier, that went through like the open air markets of France. So when Nick says meme, it's not just a beautiful painting in these cases or a very famous painting. I don't know how beautiful they are. It's the fact that they were also turned into engravings that could be mass produced. And so, like, literally, if you were a supporter of the revolution, you would have this hanging in your home and, like, and so on. I also like to talk about how much this created sort of a macabre, like, culture in France at the time with, like, not only the beheadings and so on, but, like, literally in your house, you had a painting of this slain dude in a bathtub, right? Like, right. Just think about that as interesting. The law of suspects ends up being passed during this time period as propaganda like grows in, on September 9th of 1793. The reason I bring up the law of suspects is this law gives like the, the committee of public safety like free reign to like go throughout both like urban and rural areas and just pick up anybody they, they think might be challenging the revolutionary ideals and just like pick them up. Like well, they, they have to keep things safe, right? Well, they have to keep things safe, but you can see right here, just like we pick on the United States for violating its Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. like almost right away, like the First Amendment is shit on almost like immediately with the Sedition Acts. Well, France does something very oh, similar 100%. here too, yeah. right? Like they're, they're crapping on at least those first three articles we mm -hmm. just read right here with this law of suspects. Why the hypocrisy of revolutionary leaders, man? I don't know. I mean, you're right. This is a trend that we see in almost every single revolution where the revolution is founded on certain auspices. And then as soon as someone rises to power, they immediately go against those to solidify their position. And I mean, the revolutionary here would argue that this was a necessary evil, right? right? They had to do this to solidify the revolution. And like, there is a debate to be made for that. Yeah. The well, American case is completely different, but in this case, it, yeah. Well, I guess we could debate that, which we won't right now because the episode is going to be a lot. Like yeah. the show trials in Cuba and Russia right. and so on. You know. But here's the difference. Like in, 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 in neither of those – the, the number, I guess, is the shocking yeah. part right. here. So the reign of terror, use of the public's, uh, Committee of Public Safety under the law of suspects – eventually rounds out, uh, rounds up on record 17,000 suspects that are challenging the revolution and executes them all publicly by the... Guillotine. The most famous symbol of the French Revolution, the guillotine, off with their heads. Um, but it is likely, and most historical sources agree on this, even though there's 17,000 on like record, or like actual record, it's more like 40,000. Mm -hmm. 40,000 people executed by guillotine under this law of suspects. Um... Which is crazy. It, it, this reign of terror leads to, as, as all like great bouts of violence lead to, a reaction. And this, it's literally called the Thermidorian reaction, a somewhat conservative reaction, which again, it's natural. There's blood everywhere. Basically, all the revolutionaries, clubs, moderates, Girondines, and even other Jacobins begin to blame, somebody has to be blamed for like this instability and violence. And they begin to blame like Robespierre and his closest like colleagues. Robespierre's regime is, bra is, is, is blamed for not just like violence and instability, but challenging the ideas of like the more liberal revolutionary process rather than the more radical. Conspiracies during the Thermidorian reaction lead to the arrests, um, including his. He ends up not dying by guillotine, but he ends up shot in the face. And more mass executions. So the Thermidorian reaction like reacts violently as well, which is mm. always a great irony. I always like the story, which like, I'm not sure is 100 percent true, but in our Thomas Paine episode, we talk about it. Thomas Paine was actually imprisoned throughout this time, right? And the story is that the executioner he was supposed to be executed, but the executioner skipped his cell. His cell was like mismarked and like went to the next one and didn't take him out for like beheading. Some sources and and figures 
make the Thermidorian reaction almost like more violent than the Reign of Terror. And that is debatable. Like if the reaction to the Reign of Terror, like it, it, was it the Reign of Terror that killed more people or was it Thermidorian reaction? This is what we know. Thousands of people died yeah, through so this whole way, So many heads. Yeah, so many heads were lost during this time period. Eventually, though, stability did win out and a new executive is selected. And rather than it being any single executive, whether it is an emergency dictator like... Um, uh, uh, Robespierre, uh, it's definitely not going to be a monarch anymore, like Louis dead and the, and the succession is over, right? That's like the goal there. So they decide they're going to create a directory. A five-man directory is like the executive branch, rather than having like one president or anything. It's a five-man directory. And the legislation, uh, actual like legislative branch, would be councils of 500 and 250 elders in this Republican period. So like all of these are answerable to the people, excuse me, to the men of France, right? To all of the, the men of France. This setup was wildly unpopular and it was wildly ineffective. And I must stress, it's still trying to, France is still trying to navigate international wars, which even though it's winning and it is winning, like they're winning everywhere they go. They are kicking ass. They're like France is taking over large swaths of Europe at this point. They're winning a lot. So that part is actually successful. I guess these these soldiers are hopped up on their their, their French national anthem and their tricolor, but like whatever, they're they're winning. But even though they're winning, like the instability and constant warfare is unpopular, and many people begin to even advocate for like a return of Louis the Seventeenth. Now, Sixteenth is dead, right? He's gone. But Louis the Seventeenth. In fact, royalists, we're calling them royalists, even begin to win some seats in the assembly in 1797, although they're, they're never going to be a majority. I must stress that people were getting tired of the revolutionary process, and we're like 10 years in at this. And uh, yeah, I mean, 10 years, a decade of like instability and violence and starvation and like mm -hmm. people would get weary. And when people get weary, maybe they just want to go back to the old thing. I mean, we're seeing that a little bit in modern politics a little bit, but... Mm -hmm. Um, a short-lived coup in 1799 eventually leads to the rise of a consulate, um, a trio. Uh, basically, I'm not going to go through like the entire trio of consuls that would become um, um, the leaders of France because they actually don't last long enough to even matter. A very famous military commander of these wars on tyranny who uh, was actually just on his way from conquests in Egypt back um, to deal with some political issues here in Paris would eventually seize the day. None other than Napoleon Bonaparte would like, again, you, through both influence, threat, all of the things you can think of, weasel his way into the consulate until ultimately outmaneuvering the other two to become the first consul of the Republic, which is just a fancy way of saying he's going to be the dictator from this right. point forward. I, I know I went through like Napoleon's ability to seize power in France way too quickly, but that's not what this episode is about. And it probably does deserve its own episode. Probably not by us. It's not a history we're super into about how Napoleon was able to use the things I talked about vaguely, like intrigue and political outmaneuvering and obviously threat to become this consul, but just know that he does. And that's the end of like this first and second stage of the revolution. But this, even with Napoleon, this interregnum under Napoleon, we must stress that France has, or, like, the ideas are already out there. Like, the, the, the nationalism's out there. The economic liberalism's out there. The metric system is out there. The idea of the third estate, the people, it's already out there. So even though France backslides a little bit in its own country under a dictator, and that's what Napoleon was, the progressivism that will eventually infect the whole world or affect the whole world I guess both. Um, it's already out there. So the process is there. So even though, like, again, in terms of material perspective for the next couple of, well, next decade under Napoleon, it's going to be regressive. It's it's already started. Yeah, it doesn't even matter for the rest of the globe. The toothpaste is out of the tube, right? There's no, it doesn't matter what Napoleon does in France. The ideas are already out there globally. What do you think of this? We, 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 we Let's close us out with your thoughts on this. Like, I, I, I went through the, some parts of the history in too much detail and others I glossed over too much. But the idea is there for Nick to kind of like build on. What, what are your thoughts on like the revolutionary nature of this first part of the French Revolution? Like you talked about in the very beginning, like uh, every historian points to this as like the archetypical example of revolution, right? We can debate, which we have, like whether the, in the uh, American War of Independence was truly a revolution based on the definition of a revolution and so on. But no one debates whether or not the French Revolution was actually a revolution. I mean, it definitely um, upended the social and economic order and political order, like, without, with, there were not any doubts there. It completely yeah. 
I actually like to focus on the ideological aspects of it related to individual identity, right? It completely deconstructs. If you were a serf, like, or even nobility, your identity related to your social status was completely destroyed and had to be completely manufactured, which is where we get to, like, Jared's critique of nationalism and so on. But for me, that's why it was just so influential. And, like, clearly the idea is spread to, like, Haiti and to other places across the globe that lead to other revolutions. That's it, man. That's all we have. I mean, I know that was a long one. Thank you for sticking with us through this one. Uh, the French Revolution, there's no short way to do it, if we're honest. Yeah, so, uh, there's really not. There's really not, and we cut out a lot. But, uh, again, thank you for sticking with us. French Revolution, The uh, is it the model? We, we Well, we don't know, but in this episode, it seems like we came to the conclusion that it kind of we lean that way. We definitely lean that way as the model. Yep. All right, take us out. If you enjoy what we do, uh, talk to us on Twitter. We are uh, at Rev and Ideology. If you really, really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon. Thank you to our uh, few Patreon supporters that we do have. You enable us to have a little bit more income every month, and our goal is really to be able to focus on creating this content uh, full-time if possible. So if you really like what we're doing, share our stuff and support us on Patreon. I'm Nick. Jared. Later.